Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. It's the open line first Monday program. For you, those of you on the other side of the world, it's uh, early Tuesday, but uh, welcome to the program. This episode of the program is uh, the episode in which we want your phone calls and emails to drive our discussion. You're an extremely part, important part of this program, more than the other episodes. So as soon as we get callers and emails that, uh, you know, the calls and, and emails are, are ripe for our guests tonight, we'll take them. So let me give you the, the phone numbers right off the bat. 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, 205-271-2980. Or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Now, the Open Line Monday program is when I invite back a guest that's previously shared their journey on the program. And our guest tonight is Michael Cumby. We figure what's well, been about three, four years since you were on the program. Michael is a former Baptist minister, former charismatic Episcopal priest, but I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag completely yet and uh, <laughs> let you share that. So, Michael, first of all, welcome back to the thank journey. You, home. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been great. too long. It's been too long. It's, four years. Yeah. Great to see you. In a little bit, I'm going to ask you to tell the audience what you've been doing in those four years and how the Lord has opened up the door for you to do things that you never would have dreamed you'd be doing 10, 15, 20 That's years right. ago. That's right. But as a background to that, let the audience know a little bit of your journey. I'll be yeah, happy sure. to tell that little story. It's a three-hour story we're going to do in five minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> we believe in miracles. Uh, raised in the heart of the Deep South. Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, so you're, yep. you're at home down yep. here with me, yep. and uh, steeped in Southern Baptist tradition, which is a wonderful tradition, wonderful people that uh, really grounded my life in Jesus Christ, in the scriptures, in, in a love for God, uh, you know, I, it was, of course, automatically, uh, God has to be first in everything that you do, the way I was, mm -hmm. the way I was raised, mother was a strong, had strong, strong faith, still does, a strong little Southern Baptist girl, about five feet tall, pure white hair, and she can still tell me exactly what's right and what's wrong. And uh, uh, so uh, my dad was not a religious man at all. As a matter of fact, he was a little bit anti-church and anti-God, didn't want anything to do with the Lord. So mom raised six kids, basically, every Saturday night, polish your shoes for Sunday school, read your Sunday school lesson, we are going to church. So that's, uh, that's the faith background I had, and I'm so grateful for it. And you had a mess of of uh, uh, pastors in your background. Oh, right? well, there are 16 Southern Baptist preachers in my family tree. That's amazing. So it's, I know, amazing. I got the can't help it. It's in my blood. <laughs> I used to tell people all over the country as I travel now that my diaper said it, <laughs> Baptist on the front and do you tithe on the back? I don't know. <laughs> are you saved? I mean, from the time, as soon as I could talk, I knew it. Well, I, you know, ha having that heritage then, uh, I was about 14 years old and uh, down in South Alabama here, uh, where EWTN is located, about four hours south of us down at the beach in Gulf Shores area. The uh, Baptists have a camp where all the kids go every summer. Yet, So Baldwin Baptist Camp uh, is where I discerned my vocation. I felt the call to preach, Baptists would say, and I knew that uh, my life was to be given to the work of the church and the work of ministry and that I would spend the rest of my life serving God's people in some capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, had a little bit of a gift for music, a little talent for singing, so I pursued a career in that. I uh, Got a scholarship to one of the local schools for music, music education. And uh, in college, had a very dramatic experience with the Holy Spirit that I was not expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, Southern Baptists are not Pentecostal, charismatic right. people. We're just, you know, we're good Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, Bible-thumping, thank you very much, preaching. But we don't do the hallelujah and the hand-clapping and tongue-speaking and prophesying and all those gifts of the Spirit mentioned in the Corinthians, but I got around some kids in college that just, there, there was something about them that was just driving me crazy. They had some <laughs> irresistible aura about them. And finally, I asked one of the kids, I said, you know, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, but you have mm -hmm. something that I've never seen before. And I don't think I have it. What is it? She said, oh, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said, the huh? <laughs> I, I never heard the term. So, you know, after hours and hours and hours of talking theology and scripture, and I knew everything, you know, I'm a Southern Baptist boy with my briefcase full and all of my ammunition from the scriptures, these things have passed away, and speaking of tongues is of the devil, and all the things. After several hours, 
they finally prayed for me and with me, and I had this wonderful release of the Holy Spirit, and most of our friends are familiar with the charismatic renewal and, and what goes along with that in the 70s. This was 1979. Well, that really changed my life and changed the course of my life and the course of my ministry. I was on staff at a little Baptist church working my way through college, and they said, Now, Michael, <coughs> we're Baptists. And we love you. And we say amen every once in a while. But all this hallelujah and praise the Lord stuff has got to go. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. I thought, well, maybe I should transfer to a school that, where they teach preachers how to preach. And let's see what they do. I'm going to take some preaching classes. I was just doing music. I'm going to take some preacher classes, pastoral theology. I'm going to change my major. So I transferred to Mobile College, which is a Baptist school, and lasted about six months. <laughs> Had a, a black roommate and I were the only two black oh, the guys that lived, you know, we were fighting this whole racial thing. And so we were, we were going to prove to everybody what the Holy Spirit could do and tear down all the walls. And we had T-shirts made that said, Acts chapter 2, I do, do you? Well, we like to get thrown off the campus. <laughs> <laughs> it was not, it's not a Baptist T-shirt. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's why when I was ordained to the priesthood, they called me Father Troublemaker. But <laughs> so that continued my journey. But what happened, Marcus, to me mainly with that conversion experience of being more open to the Holy Spirit was to realize for the first time that maybe there's more to my Christian faith and to the Christian faith period. And there may be some theology that I don't know about or I might need to change because I had this experience that my denomination said has passed away. It's not for today, but it so radically changed my life. That began the journey for me of really being hungry for everything God had now I'll tell you. Being Catholic was nowhere in the picture. <laughs> I was raised so anti-Catholic. Uh, Stephen Ray, I'll never forget one of the first times I heard Stephen Ray speak, another Baptist convert to the church. He's, uh, we were raised the same way. Don't you ever, ever go inside of a Catholic. If you ever go into a Catholic church, you can't get out. <laughs> now, I don't know if we thought you had trap doors up by the altar. Or you, when you get in there, you turn into a statue. I don't know. <laughs> I, we were scared to death of Catholicism. It was full of, in smoke, and, and, and they put robes on them, but they call them Father. We never could fit. They got a dress on, but they call him Father. We couldn't figure that out. <laughs> they talked to dead people in there. They got statues to dead people. Just the worship of Catholic, Catholic worship was so strange to us because if you understand traditional evangelical preaching and singing, we preach, we sing, we pray, we repent, we have an altar call, and we go home. No dresses, no holy smoke, no dead people, no statues. <laughs> No cookies, no wafers, no, you know, it's just, oh, nah. body and blood of Jesus. Are you kidding? Get out of here. <laughs> so uh, I was raised, you know, the Pope was the Antichrist in our circles. Uh, the great whore of Babylon, you've heard this from all your guests, I'm sure, or a bunch of them. All the bad things about religion, that's the Catholicism. And it was, a, it was a, uh, our goal in life, of course, as evangelical, was to try to bring everybody to faith in Christ. But boy, especially Catholics, hmm. if you got you a Catholic, you get a special prize. You know, I could cut their head off and put a trophy on the wall. Look, not only did I get him, but he was Catholic. I, I got a Catholic. So, uh, you know, our heart was right. We were zealous soul winners. But boy, was our theology messed up. And we had a lot of misinformation. So this experience, as I mentioned, of the Holy Spirit began to change my life and change me and open my heart, basically, to get rid of prejudice. And it began a journey for me to really study all of Christendom, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Nazarene, Assembly of God, all of them. And the free churches, the Hallelujah, Care, Method, Catholic, Episcopals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Hadwell was on a program <laughs> recently. <don't> <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot of them out there because when the renewal came, the charismatic renewal came, many mainline uh, traditional Christians had this experience with the Holy Spirit and they were no longer welcome in their mainline church. So they... They ended up all leaving and they found each other, you know, birds of a feather. So we rented storefronts and YMCA buildings and all these. And now, 25 years later, they all have beautiful facilities and big churches and they're reaching the world because of this powerful experience of Pentecost. Well, to make a very long story short, which is available on our website, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the, whole, the CD, the whole story. Um, I went to a conference in 1990 or 91. A little Pentecostal preacher stood up in front of about 40 pastors, and we thought we were coming to a church growth conference. The next how-to. We had a you know, more effective youth ministry, better worship, a more children's program. What's the latest thing? And uh, the preacher stood up, and I wasn't ready for what he said. He stood up in front of us, evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic pastors, and said, the church in America is irrelevant. Now, next to me was 
Brother Henry. Henry was just a little country preacher from Georgia, and he poked me and said, what did he say? <laughs> Irrelevant was a big word for him. I said, well, wait, wait a minute. He said, the church in America is irrelevant. I said, Henry, I think he said me and you is wasting our time. <laughs> I thought I've been working in the church in America since I was 14 years old. My first job, Little Friendship Baptist Church down in Bond Secure, Alabama, was to cut the grass, clean the toilets, and do a children's choir. <laughs> so I started in the ministry. They told me the way to the pulpit is through the bathroom, <laughs> through the throne. You clean, if you can serve, well, you, you know the point. If you can serve in the menial task, then God, one day God might let you go in the pulpit and preach. So, buddy, I was scrubbing toilets, cutting grass, and teaching children's choir. 14, 15 years old. I uh, was licensed to preach by the First Baptist Church in Foley, Alabama when I was 16, which all that means is we recognize, you discern you have a vocation, so go to school. And uh, so when this little pastor got up and said the church is irrelevant, I just, but you know, I knew he was right. Way down in my heart, he said, if you think Christianity is having an impact on America, and this is what my life has always been about as a Southern Baptist turned Assembly of God, Pentecostal, Charismatic, then on through the priesthood in the Charismatic Episcopal Church, and now as a Catholic lay evangelist, is helping people find God. That's the heart of evangelical Christianity, and I love that. Do, and th that we have some different methods now. A little bit, we're a little bit more couth about how we do it as Catholics instead of walking up to you on the street going, are you saved? <laughs> do you know Jesus Christ? <laughs> you know, I, we just, in our zeal sometimes, we weren't always real couth. Yeah. A lot of wisdom. So, but that still was the driving force to make sure everybody had heard the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the The Great Commission is the heart of evangelical Christianity, yeah. like John 6 is the heart of Catholic Christianity. And so it was, it was that yearning and knowing we were not reaching America. America's losing its mind. It has no concept anymore, generally, of, of right and wrong. There's no black and white, no objective truth. Only so everything's subjective. Well, truth changes with the situation. You know, it's just subject to whatever. that might be sin today, but it may not be sin tomorrow. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, alternative lifestyles being approved now that the scripture really condemns. Uh, forced euthanasia on the way. Culture of death we've heard so much about. I knew something was terribly wrong, and so he, I thought this preacher might be on to something. Well, he proceeded to take a week to tell us <laughs> that the cure for America's problem is that we as evangelical Protestant pastors must return to ancient liturgy and sacramental theology. This time I poked Henry and said, what did he say? <laughs> I'd never heard the word sacrament. Yeah. I had no, Sacramento, California, that's the closest you can get for me. <laughs> I, had no, I didn't know what that was. What is a sacrament? That's not a part of Protestant theology. Yeah. And uh, he said, if you'll stay with me for a week, I will tell you why I say that. And we proceeded for a week to unpack that statement. The church in America is irrelevant, and the cure is that we return to ancient liturgy and sacramental theology. And that started us on a journey, 40 or 50 of us, that absolutely changed our lives. Was that the, the group that then started that? Charismatic started the Episcopal? whole new denomination. You know, good yeah. Protestants, if you can't find a church you like, you just start one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't find anybody that's doing what you think God's called you to do, and I've said that facetiously, but uh, we were in all, in all <laughs> earnest. We, couldn't, we wanted to be charismatic. We wanted to be evangelical because we still believe every person needs a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And we wanted to restore all the things lost in the Reformation. <laughs> just, a, just a small order, right? But all those historic Eucharist and sacraments and having holy space and an altar. You know, we had altar calls, but we didn't have an altar. How do you have an altar call without an altar? So, we, you know, we just had to do, we went back and took some history lessons is what we did. We tried to take off our Baptist glasses or our Methodist glasses or our Presbyterian, because you read the scripture, you can't help it, through the lens of your upbringing. So as a Southern Baptist, I interpreted scriptures like I was taught in light of Southern Baptist doctrine. When I went over among the Pentecostals, I got some new glasses. They were Pentecostal glasses. They were a lot more fun. <laughs> but anyway, I began to see scriptures that I didn't see as a Baptist and didn't understand as a Baptist that now, oh, this is about the Holy Spirit and his power and miracles. And so that changed me. But all of us interpret the scripture through the lens in which we were raised. And so people say, well, Michael, now you got Catholic glasses. I go, yes, but they're the original pair. <laughs> I'm going to stop you there because it's 
as uh, you mentioned, for those of you that would love to hear the whole story, a couple of sources for that. Number one, you can go to uh, EWTN Religious Catalog and get the first time you're on the journey home, which yes. is one option, but that's still a shortened version because you said you have the whole version available at your website. Yes. What's your website? WW, it's real, real complicated. MikeCumby.org. All right. All right. All right. And uh, well, we have a couple great emails. Uh, in fact, there was an early one. Uh, I, yeah, I want to go with this one first. This is a great one. This is, comes from D in Kentucky. Michael, as a former Pentecostal, when Father delivers a particularly moving and meaningful sermon, do you miss not being able to say, Amen, yes, you're so right, <laughs> preach it, Father, etc.? Thanks, and God bless you, you and Mark. <laughs> you bet you're a bippy. <laughs> We were in Mass last, this past Saturday night. We go to St. Margaret's in Foley. Father Paul Zogby is our priest. And he, he made, I mean, no, Catholic priests do not preach like Pentecostal or Baptist preachers. We understand that because the sermon is not the, the whole reason you're there. The Eucharist is why we're there. So that's a major paradigm shift. But every once in a while, I just have to sit on myself and say, mm, that was really good. And my wife will poke me, don't you dare say, but I, I, occasionally I let a little amen slip. Of course, you know, all the folks in the church turn around and think, who said that? They're getting used to me, though. But yeah, I do miss that. That expression, you know, Pentecostals love the Holy Spirit and have probably been more welcoming to the Holy Spirit than any other Christian group. They love, and they... They love praising the Lord and giving verbal expression to, and at times that's appropriate. The scripture talks about shouting for jo joy and clapping your hands, and they just incorporate it in their worship. Catholics can do it too. It won't, it won't hurt them. Right. But there are rubrics. I mean, there the, are the, rules. The, the point you don't want to jump up and dance down the aisle right in the middle of the elevation. Yeah. There are rules. There's a, there's a place to do that. The best place for shouting and clapping is like in a, in a prayer group or um, a charismatic Bible study or one of our conferences. You know, it's time just to pray. Yeah. Not the mass particularly. But, but the reason I mentioned that was not to, to back off a bit, but really to say that in Protestantism, where you and I both came from, I was a Presbyterian at congregations for a while, that as pastors, we kind of had the freedom to reinvent worship whenever we felt. Oh, like absolutely. It. And it was fun. And the danger. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun. But within the Catholic and Church, dangerous, but the, it was fun. the wisdom of the church has, says, here's the, the, this is the arena. This is the, uh, the, the way it fits together. This makes sense. Absolutely. The wisdom of 2,000 years. And so we're not advocating, hey, go out there and uh, reinvent your own thing. But as you said, there are places. There are times when, especially prayer meetings, and in the, in the uh, Vatican II documents, in the, um, the document liturgy, there's a call for Bible services. Yeah, yeah. I've not seen very many Bible <laughs> services yet. I'm still waiting for them. We're working on it. But you know, one of the most refreshing things <laughs> is just, let's camp on that point for no structure and rubrics and... For just a minute, one of the most refreshing things for me in, in coming home to structure and rubrics, rubrics for those who may not know, are, are the rules that you go by in the Mass. There's, there's like rules at the dinner table at home, and there's rules about cleaning your room and household rules. These are the rubrics. These are the household rules when we come together as Catholics to perform our service of worship to God. You sing here, you kneel there, you make the sign of the cross. I mean, there's just a, And it was so refreshing because I had gotten to the point, Marcus, as an independent charismatic, hallelujah, Bible-thumping, devil-chasing, Jesus-loving, <laughs> shut-your-mouth preacher, charismatic Christian, that anything goes in the worship service. And, and, and we had gotten this, the Spirit is leading me, had gotten so out of hand that, and the pastor really, you know, we don't have fathers, they're not, they're not our fathers, they're not priests, they're just old brother so-and-so, we're all the same, brother, you know, bro, mm -hmm. priesthood of all believers. And so who's to say the Holy Spirit didn't tell me to do thus and so in the service? I know you're the pastor, but I can hear from God just like you. And I tell you, it just turned into a free-for-all circus. Not always, but sometimes. And we used to really pride ourselves on, Whoa, come to our church. You'll never know what's going to happen. And usually that scared people to death because yeah. they yeah. never knew it to happen. One of the most refreshing things about rubrics and the Mass is that you always know what to expect. And don't think, I thought... The Holy Spirit can't move in that framework. You got him all boxed in and you can't move and you can't shout and you can't. You got to cross here and you got to flatten. You got to kneel and you got to get you some holy water. I, how could God be in all the stuff? And I tell you, for a wild Pentecostal preacher, God was in all the stuff. It was yeah. good for me to sit down and shut up and let the choir do the same. Well, the, the book of Galatians that Paul wrote to deal with, I think, the main reason was the problems of the first consul when the church is going to change a few things. Mm. And there were those that didn't want to change. You know, you got to circumcise those Gentiles. 
And some are saying you don't have to circumcise those Gentiles. Right. So the church uses authority in the first council to make some major changes. And we ended up after that very first council in Jerusalem, a group called the Libertines. We really can do anything we want to do. The legalists, no, we got to do it the way it used to do. And what was Paul's answer? You walk by the Spirit. And the danger is that many of the free-flowing Pentecostals, right. evangelicals, kind of are really being libertines with their understanding of walking by the Spirit. They're just giving the stamp of what the Holy Spirit's telling them to do. That's right. But they're That's right. walking by the Spirit means, where is the Spirit speaking? The church. Uh, one walking most, by the Spirit is following the church. One of the most powerful things I discovered was there is no freedom without boundaries. I got it from Archbishop Fulton Sheen, who's become one of my heroes, who said, the, the, the banks of a river, well, a river without banks is what? A flood. A flood. <laughs> we don't have any rules. We don't have any regulations. The liturgy is the track that the train runs on. And God can do all kind of stuff while the train's running, but it stays on track. Yep. And that's very refreshing. And believe it or not, I know a lot of my Protestant pastor friends and, and Pentecostal friends would think, oh, I could, I, that's so, that looks like dead form and ritual. Oh, precious, if you ever understand what's going on in that ritual, and especially if you're a spirit-filled Christian, if you're a Pentecostal charismatic person, you're going to have a hard time being still. It is so powerful from vestments to holy smoke to statues to beautiful music, stained glass windows. I know we were taught all that is dead religious gobbledygook. But I tell you, you understand Catholic worship like it was meant to be. It will change well, your life. If, if you don't understand what crossing yourself means, that it isn't a mere act. Right. You know, you were, it has to do with our baptism. There's a lot of stuff going on there that involves good catechesis, involves the right heart, in other words, involved with it. And, uh, you know, that's that danger. Is, the other thing is that we used to stamp all this freedom as the work of the Spirit, right. saying, and the Spirit can't work in this clothes, but the reality is, what is it that we want the Spirit to do? We want it to change. Well, I want it to change me. This is what we want to be changed. I mean, changed. I love the goosebumps. You can probably tell. I'm kind of an emotional person. <laughs> I love the goosebumps. I love the shouting. I love good singing, good music. And I, you don't have to throw, you don't have to give that up to become Catholic. You, you won't have all that ha happening in a mass. But the important thing is, first, the first thing, we're called, first of all, to be worshipers of God. I think all Christians would agree. We're not called first to evangelize. I thought we were. First, we're called to worship. That's what my, my focus around the nation is authentic worship. What kind of worship does God love? So get your worship straight first. Get your theology, get your doctrine right about what worship is. And then evangelization flows from that. Feeding the poor, better marriages, uh, uh, pro-life. Uh, everything else flows. Soup kitchens comes out of I got my worship straight. Yep. In my not so humble opinion. I agree. There's that constant tension between evangelization and renewal. Which comes first? If you go out to evangelize them, what are you going to bring them back to? Right. So you got renewal too, but you don't want to be just locked in that your room. That was my dilemma. It's a both and. Who, what know? are you going to bring them back to? Yep. If you're a soul winner, Michael, be a soul winner. I do want to be a soul. I still want to be. That's all I care about. It's to making sure. Do you know? Do you have a relationship with God? At least because I know it's the most wonderful thing on the planet. If you really, I didn't. I didn't mean. I didn't ask you. Are you religious? I said, or do you have a relationship with God? The God that made you it will change your life. So, because of that. I thought, okay, I'm going to go out soul winning, knocking on doors. Hello, good morning, praise the Lord. I'm Pastor blah, 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 down at First Church of Hubba Bubba. We're starting a new <laughs> church, and we'd like to know. Do you know the Lord? You know, look. Well, if I led him to Christ, then where would I send him to church? Let's see, you should be Presbyterian. No, you know, with your personality, you'd be a better Baptist than you would a Presbyterian. <laughs> then I get over here to Hallelujah House, and I thought, oh, no, all y'all need to go to Pentecostal Church. Thank you very much. Where do you send them? Because they're all, they're all wonderful church groups. They're all, one, no, they're not churches. There's only one church. They're all wonderful non-Catholic ecclesial communities. How about that, friend? <laughs> how you like that? Took me three years to learn how to say that. Christians who love Jesus Christ, they aren't in full communion with the church he started, but they're Christians. And they have this, we all have the same desire. We're trying to get people to heaven. We want them to know, and I tell you, one of the most wonderful, they're so, it's just so cool to be Catholic, but one of the most wonderful things is when I got the first little Baltimore catechism, and it said, who made me? Well, I knew God made me, but I never knew why. <laughs> and just to find out the purpose, of, well, as an evangelical Protestant Christian, I assumed that I was made to, to win souls. 
But that's not why I was made. I was made to know, love, and serve God here so that I might enjoy eternal happiness with him in the next life forever. Well, shut up. <laughs> now I know what I'm doing here. Don't sh shut your mouth, boy. First, you got to know God, love him, and then serve him. Well, what does it mean to know him? We could spend an hour on that. What does it mean to love him above all things? And then what does it mean to serve him? You cannot love him and serve him without loving people and serving them. There's your evangelization. Oh, just, I'm telling you, becoming Catholic just took all the pieces of the puzzle that I already had as a, as a Christian. I mean, I already, we had repentance and scripture and prayer and confession and singing and, 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 and it put all those pieces in the right place. Is the Catholic Church perfect? Heavens, no. Well, the church is, but are Catholics perfect? Lord, have mercy. Of course yeah, not. Yeah. When you and I, I don't know. The I'm telling you, it was, perfect. <laughs> it, was, it was perfect till we got there. It's not perfect anymore. You know, there's not a perfect group out there, but the church is perfect yeah. because she's the truth. She has the truth. It's, and yeah. it just was floored me to find out this really is the church that and, Jesus And started. all that stuff you're saying, also the beauty of it is that it's connected with 2,000 years of this, not just you're doing it this weekend, and then somebody right. else is doing it from scratch the next weekend. Starting, and constantly starting. Trying to decide each Sunday what's the right way. And, and <coughs> the idea of I'm gonna, what I'm going to bring them back to when I evangelize them. Then you get caught up with making the service more appealing, the place more comfortable. Right. How are you going to keep them there, keeping the bathrooms clean, you know, and the parking lots growing. You have all those issues as opposed to what was really intended as the center, what you're going to bring them to, the Eucharist. Yeah. See, what do you mean? The, uh, bring them to the Eucharist. I, I drove me crazy. I have a talk that's also available on our website called The Way We Worship. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. To, once a preacher, always a preacher, right? Commercials. <laughs> called The Way, it's, it's about worship. The, what, is the, what is worship to begin with? And then all these substitutes for worship, the evangelistic tent, the psychiatric couch, the television show mentality you mentioned. If you're, if you're into the entertaining thing and we got the best band and the best youth choir and the greatest mimes yeah. and skits, then you have to have a better show this week than you had last week. Every week it has to get better or they won't keep coming because we're, let us entertain you. <laughs> and so we've taught America as evangelical Protestant Christians, many, not all, but many yeah. times, that the, the church follows the curvature of culture. And so if that's entertaining in culture, we're going to bring it into the church. We'll have the same thing. And we have completely lost our focus. Of, not, not everybody, because I heard a great Pentecostal four-square pastor wrote on the back of the book, of one of the cover of his, one of his books, this is a Protestant. The center of Christian worship is Holy Communion. Now, he didn't use the word Eucharist, but I like to fell out on the floor just when he said, it's Holy Communion. <laughs> Real worship, Marcus, has to involve offering back to God the only thing that's ever pleased him perfectly, and that's his son. Well, I, I look, study, begin to study all the groups and how they worship and what do they do when they come together on Sundays. And I like that died when I looked over at the Roman Catholic Mass and said, oh my God, that's what they do. <laughs> They've been to, they offer back to God the sacrifice of the Son that has pleased Him perfectly, Jesus. Oh, shut up, shut up. I can't, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. This, this can't be, because it went against everything I believed about Catholicism. I begin to find truth after truth after truth. I thought, say it ain't so. Oh boy, I want to take a call. I will make a quick comment before I go to the call, and that is one of the things that saddened me when I came into the church, I know you did too, is that sadly, it isn't the church, and it wasn't Vatican II, but there were an awful lot of Catholics that kind of bought into some of those evangelical mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. and kind of wanted, wanted to change the mass a little bit, right. wanted to throw out a few things, make it a little more appealing, and sadly, again, not following the church or Vatican II, have brought some of the stuff in that I wish had been left behind. And uh, I do see, and thank the Lord, that we may see soon right. a more up-to-date liturgy and some things that are gonna be uh, pruned away of some of the stuff that crept in over the last 40 years. But sometimes it takes people from outside. I've been there, guys. Why are you going there? I <laughs> Why are you going there? We've been there. That's right. You know, that God gave us the tracks for the train to fall. So why are you un always unsatisfied with that? You've got to make your own side cuts. But don't you, I know you understand, Marcus, too, how there are some very powerful aspects to Protestant oh. worship and right. conversion. And so many times Catholics will go outside the church, 
They get involved in a Protestant Bible study, which has been good for them uh, as long as it doesn't become anti-Catholic, and they undergo a real conversion. Yep. The yep. problem is they, bring, they come back to the Catholic Church say, let's change this whole thing and be like that. No, yep. you can incorporate that good Bible study in the, in the that's, part of the, that's part of our Catholic yep. faith, believe it or not. You don't have to try to change the church to become hallelujah, Bobo and come kumbaya, my Lord, with the guitar. To incorporate yep. good Bible study and fellowship and loving each other and all the right. strong points. Well, I, you know, the, the Micah Project is our, our new ministry, and it, the, the subtitle is Tearing Down the Walls that Divide Christians. And, it, it, it's, you know, it's almost like you're, when you're, my parents got divorced, and I'm thinking, I love you both, and I'm trying to get you back together. You both have great things. Now, the Catholic Church is right, period. But there are some wonderful things happening out here, and I think most converts would agree that they, if they come home to the church, there, there's some wonderful things they miss, but they love the truth more than the things they miss. But what we're working for is to bring all those wonderful things home to the church under the structure of the church and under the authority of yeah. the bishops, and then we can, I, mean, you can, you can, I think we can have it all. Yeah, and I, there's a statement in the ecumenical document in Vatican II that says, whatever the Holy Spirit has engraced in the hearts of our separated brethren is for our spiritual renewal. Wow. Now, now that points to, the, on the one hand, the fact that the Holy Spirit does work out there. Absolutely. Of course it does. Absolutely. But, on the other hand, the Apostle Paul said something very important in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Don't ordain a new convert, because it takes us a while. It takes us a while to make the transition to appreciate that some of the things we loved, well, maybe we do need to leave some of those things behind. Right. And so it takes a while. That's why us converts have got to be held down with weights for a while before we, you know. Did you see all the weights? They right outside the door, all my <laughs> weights are there. They won't let me loose hardly. So we make sure that we understand what the tracks are that the train's exactly. supposed to flow on. And, uh, you know, Lord help us if, we, if we're pushing off the side sometime because we love the church and converts aren't better than those that have always been Catholics. The truth is every one of us needs to be a convert. Every single Catholic needs to have the, the, the reality of a converted heart. It doesn't just automatically happen with baptism. And, well, you know who yeah. my heroes? My heroes are cradle Catholics who are still in the church because if they had all left and they'd all ran down to Hubba Bubba's Bible study, yeah. there'd have been no church for me to come home to. When I discovered all this wonderful truth, oh my Lord, Eucharist is real. Oh, shut up, it's true. Then I want to go to the local church and close because they all went down to Hallelujah, church, <laughs> or wherever. Well, here we said it was open line first Monday, and we'd be just gabbing Oops. the whole time. So we're going to take Sorry. a quick break. We've got calls <laughs> waiting. We'll be right back in a moment. Welcome back to the Journey Home Program. Our guest tonight is Michael Cumby. Before we take some phone calls and emails, and we will get to you, we, we won't just keep gabbing, we promise. Uh, I do want, though, to take a moment to remind you that this coming weekend is EWTN's 25th uh, family celebration here in Birmingham. Father Andrew Apostoli, Father John Carapi, Dr. Scott Hahn, Bob and Penny Lord, I'll be here. Uh, we'll all be here to thank you for your support. If you would like to come. The tickets are, are free, but you might want to call and make sure there's space. Uh, you can find out at the website, EWTN25.com, or you can call us, 877-EWTNS25, or 877-398-6725. Thank you very much. All right, let's see. We have a caller, and it is, there it is. Sean, North Carolina. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Yes, sir. Um, I'm charismatic Episcopalian. Um, was brought up Assemblies of God. Um, was confirmed in the CEC this year. And um, my biggest thing is I'm, I'm kind of on a journey, yeah. and um, a exactly. spiritual journey. And I want to, we visited a, a Catholic church, and my biggest uh, hang-up or, or problem would be, the, would be Mary and the, and the 
intercession of the saints, I guess, yeah. which both of you probably know coming from Protestant yeah. um, backgrounds. It's kind of hard to get over, and, yeah. and especially when I've got a long line of family members, a grandfather, great-grandfather that were Protestant men, ministers. Yeah. How did you, uh, both of you overcome that? All right. <laughs> Sean, first of all, you're in our prayers because we know the journey, and we know you love Jesus Christ, so we're brothers in that, and so our prayers are with you. Now, um, Michael, I know you had no problem with Mary in the pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> My biggest hurdle to overcome, Sean, right? Yeah. To come into the church, I was a priest and I was a founding pastor in the Charismatic Episcopal Church that you're a part of now. I was the first recording secretary at the first House of Bishops meetings. We had three bishops, and I took all the notes. So I know that group, and I love them with all my heart. They, Archbishop Adler, the founding, the primate of that church, uh, is the one who taught me all these things about liturgy and Eucharist, and uh, from a Pentecostal point of view, sacraments were so easy to understand because we already believed in laying hands on the sick and uh, we believed that God flowed through us to touch people, to cure them and to fill them with the Holy Spirit. And so we were accustomed to sacramental theology. We just didn't know you called it that. But I'll tell you, I guarantee you, brother, the hardest thing for me to overcome, we called it the doctrine of the inaccurate deception. <laughs> I know, it's one of we didn't get struck dead. But anyway, the Immaculate Conception, it, it, it's tough. And the real, one of the reasons it's so hard is because we are, we are, were, and most of my Protestant friends still are, sola scriptura Christians, the Bible alone. Uh, and there's only one verse in the Bible other than the book of Revelation that talks about a woman clothed with the sun and a crown of 12 stars. There's only one verse that uh, talks about Mary, basically, and that, you know, is in Luke when the angel appeared to her at the Annunciation and said, Hail, full of grace, I thought. How in God's green heaven do Catholics build this empire of Marian doctrine off one verse of Scripture? You got one verse, hail full of grace. And now you got this. I mean, there's a statue of Mary everywhere. Some of them got little statues talking to big statues of Mary. I mean, got statues of worship and statues. And the communion of saints and all those things. The biggest hurdle you'll have to overcome is come into the place that you believe that the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus Christ started. That's the biggie. Trouble with Mary, purgatory, call no man father, Peter and the papacy. You can't find the Pope in the Bible. Although I never listen to people's objections. What I listen to is the QBQ, the question behind the question. Why does it bother? Why would it bother you? Let's see if we can get to the root of it. If God said, I'm going to take the little girl through whom the Christ child will be born and make her very, very special. The truth is that probably really doesn't bother you. And, and you know, I'm from the South. I guess that's pretty obvious. But down here, ain't nobody like your mama. You know what I'm saying? You can talk about daddy. You can slap your uncles around, cuss your brother. But you better not touch nobody's mama. They will kill you. <laughs> so this automatic love for the blessing. Once, see, we have this SIM card in our cell phone or in our computer in our brain that has this anti-Catholic chip in it. And if you were raised like I was, it's programmed into you. Mary, and Marian devotion is a part of Catholicism, aye, aye, aye. and it sounds like, and if you're in the CEC, I already know you're on this journey toward historic Christianity anyway, because that's what that group was about. I mean, I've been out of it five years, but when we started, we were about recovering the things we had lost after the Reformation. So you're on that journey, but I'll tell you, I love the Blessed Mother, and you ought to love her too. All the, doctrinally, there's... Go on my website <laughs> and get all my tapes about, I just did a new series, and one of them, I spent two hours talking about Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how did this doctrine grow? <laughs> you know, and then I was going to do Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, oops, the papacy. But uh, yeah. that's in a new set that, that's available. It's hours, it'll take me hours. Basically, I got my answer from a set of tapes that Tim Staple taught called All Generations You'll Call Me Blessed. And I mean, it took hours and hours, hundreds of hours. And I read every book I could read, listened to every tape I could listen to because I knew for me to lay my life, to stake my life on the Catholic Church being right because this is a huge change for you. It's a, it was a, you don't just go from evangelical Protestantism all the way over here to Roman Catholicism. There is a huge gap there. So the God, God has used the Charismatic yeah. Episcopal Church in many of our lives as a little bridge to help us take little steps at a time. Yeah. We're going to learn some Catholic things, little c, but not, we're not going all the way, capital C, Roman Catholic, popes and beads. You know what I'm saying? We're going to do little Catholic things. And, and God kind of spoon-feeding us. And that's where you are. The Lord is spoon-feeding you. 
a little bit at the time. And if you're on the journey, that means your heart is open. Mark has already said you love God. That's obvious. God bless you. I'm praying for you. I know right where you are. The big thing was Mary and could not find enough scripture. So if you'll go on our website, I can't, there's no way we can give you the whole thing. But basically from Tim's tapes, I got the difference in the Greek words, pleris karitos and kakaritomine. The phrase full of grace is only, this word, Greek word for full of grace, kakaritomine, is only used one time in the scripture. And it's, uh, it's only dealing with the Blessed Virgin. She got a grace from God that's different than every other kind of grace. So filled with grace, there's no room from sin. And God prepared her from the time. Jesus was her Savior. He saved her by anticipation, if you will. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, she was baptized by anticipation, by holy fire. God gave her a special blessing so that the Christ child, she's called the Ark of the Covenant. I never heard that as a Protestant. She's the new, Ar- the new Eve and also the new Ark of the Covenant. What did the old Ark of the Covenant do? It carried the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and the anointing. And the resurrection, you know, Aaron's rod that budded. And here is the new Ark of the Covenant. That Ark of the Covenant was tried by fire and refined and purified so it could carry the word. What, please don't let it bother you that God loved Mary special and Jesus loved his mother special and God gave her a special place. That's all we're talking about. She's not the fourth member of the Godhead, which I thought a lot of Catholics, boy, they just worship, they worship that Mary. They got her everywhere. They made her the fourth member of the Godhead. No, no, no. But she's a hero. She's, our, she's the first among all the heroes. She's the first one to say yes to God that would change the world. Her yes to God changed the world. You have to understand that. And think about your own mother. Of course, you would honor her above everybody else in your life. So it's a long teaching. Dr. Hahn has fantastic stuff out. Marcus probably has stuff out, tapes and books, all about the blessed. We, but we had the same problem you did. And I guarantee you, love the Blessed Virgin. Here's what I had to do. Even when I had made my mind up to come into the church, I still couldn't understand the doctrine, and I knew I couldn't teach on it if I was asked to. So I put it on the shelf. You remember the parable of the man who found the pearl of great price and found the great treasure in the field? And he thought, holy, shut up. He buried it, went back, and sold everything he had because the treasure that he found in the field was worth it. I'm going to buy this whole field. That's what, I, that's what I did to the church. I don't understand all, I didn't understand all Catholic doctrine, all the rest of the stuff that's in the field. But I see this one pearl here that this is the church Jesus started. Shut your mouth. I'm selling the farm. We're buying this baby. <laughs> so we did it. Now, I figured I got the rest of my life. You know, the Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You got to work this thing out. And you're, got, you're never going to stop studying. I can tell that. This is a long answer to that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go buy the field. What they put in this stuff? What they put anyway. in my <laughs> Marcus is looking in my cut that out. But it, it's it. But you listen. Learn. Trust the Lord. First, the the biggest hurdle you have to overcome is, is this the church Jesus started? If she, if you can't get to the place where you can trust that, you're going to struggle with all the doctrines and stuff. The first thing you have to do is say, you know, I believe for my research and the CEC taught me this, uh, Sean. From our research in history, this is the church Jesus started. Jesus really did turn the keys over to Peter and say, you're the rock. Rocky, I'm going to build a church on you. Rocky, this is the rock, and on this rock, I'm at, you have the keys of the kingdom. Everything you bind in uh, earth bound in heaven is going to back you up. Everything loosed in, on earth is loosed in heaven. He's the man. And, and, you know, as I was in seminary as a CEC priest, we went through all these things, and I just, the more I read, the more I studied, I knew whether I like it or not, the Catholic Church is right with all her doctrines. And you'll have to, you'll have to come to the place you trust. I promise I'll try. If you can't afford those tapes and CDs, I'll give them to you. I, now, don't, now, nationwide, I just made a big mistake. But <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Come on, y'all. We're living by faith here. But I'll try, my, my life is now will be spent the rest of my getting that information into the hands of Protestants to help them, not just because I want you to be Catholic. I'm not after trying to get you to be Catholic. I want you to know as much about God and his kingdom as you possibly can. And the fullness of all that truth I found in the Catholic Church. I love all these other denominations and they all have truth. But the fullness of everything it means to be Christian, I found in the Catholic Church. And I promise you, Mary won't be a problem. You will absolutely fall in love with you if your heart is open. And and ask yourself, why am I bothered so bad? Why, Why does that one bother me so bad? The Mary thing. Why does it? Why? Why would? Why would you, would you hate it if God decided she could? She gets to be special, and that you're supposed to love her and honor her, and uh, maybe even talk to her every once in a while. I just got to tell him something. You don't need to know those tablets. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Michael. Excellent. Let's uh, take a quick email, and then we'll go to the next caller. This comes from Roland in Ottawa, Ontario. 
I'm an evangelical, seriously considering the Catholic faith. Our prayers are with you, Roland. Amen. And uh, anything we can do to help, we're here for you. I was wondering if Michael could talk about the teaching of eternal security, which I assume the Baptists teach. What convinced Michael different about this teaching, if anything? Thanks, Roland, for your email. Man, fantastic question. I'm, I'm in the middle, Marcus, right now of a six-week series in Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile. I'm in Birmingham every Wednesday night, Montgomery every Thursday night, and Mobile on Friday nights, and then I go back home to the beach. <laughs> and last night's topic was seven common misconceptions about salvation. How are we saved? And I'm going to tell you, this is, what, this is one of the things that launched, launched me or pushed me further and further in my journey is how do you get saved? And you, you're, you're exactly right. As an evangelical Protestant, here's how we get saved. And I'm so glad. I love talking about this. I always knew something was wrong. It's kind of like taking a shower with your socks on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> something just didn't feel right. When it comes to the way we, the gospel we peddled, we are telling people to become a Christian, to be saved, and then, and then have eternal security. You have to do two things. First of all, you must believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is God and that God raised him from the dead. And then you have to confess that with your mouth. Now, please know, I understand the Bible says exactly that. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and confess it with your mouth, thou shalt be saved. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to believe? Now, in our tradition, if you wanted to convert, if you wanted to become a Christian, you're not a Christian. And uh, you've been thinking about God. Maybe the Holy Spirit's working on you. Somebody somewhere has been praying for you, whatever. You go to a Billy Graham crusade or a Mike Cumbie convention or a Marcus Grodi, <laughs> hallelujah, uh, <laughs> conference in faith or a history. What's, your, what's the conference you're about Deep to in do? history. Deep in history, con whatever. And uh, there's some great preachers out there. You know, I love them. And the Holy Spirit, because they're preaching the Scripture, the Scripture is the Word of God, and it's full of power just by itself. And you're convicted. You go, you know, I'm not right with God. And the preacher invites you to come home to faith. Like Noah told those folks from the flood, was, get up here in the boat. You can be saved. Get in the church. The church is like the great ship of salvation. Come on home. Get up here. I know you got this problem, that problem. God, God doesn't care. Get in here and we'll help you. You need to be saved from yourself, from sin, from hell, from the devil, from crazy influences of a world that doesn't like God. Come in. Come on. Salvation. Now, here's the huge difference in Protestant, evangelical Protestant theology and Catholic theology. In the group I was raised with, the way you got saved and became eternally sure, you knew you were secure, you're going to go to heaven no matter what, is that you prayed that prayer, Lord Jesus, dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your only Son, and I repent, I know that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, and I believe Jesus is that Savior. I accept him into my heart as my... And you ask him, and I, as a preacher, I would lead you through the prayer. Now ask the Lord, Lord, come into me, come into my life, come into my heart. Now, I don't know how that happened, but we believed it did. As, as a Catholic, I'll tell you, it happens in the waters of baptism. Of course, I know a lot of my friends are going to go, oh, my Lord, Ethel, he's gone crazy. He thinks there's power in baptism. Yeah, there is. Not magic, but mystery, sacrament, faith. So, but anyway, in, in this context, you give your life to Christ, you pray a prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I accept you. And now you have to get up in front of the whole church and say this or it's no good. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but you have to confess with your mouth. And before, Jesus said, we, we would say, because the scripture says, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, if you won't get up and say you're a Christian, you've accepted Jesus in front of people. Now, we, that's what we made it to say. Then I won't say your name in heaven to God. And you're not saying. So you have to talk about salvation by works, but it almost sounds a little bit. <laughs> you have to do this. You have to pray. the. You have to get up out of your seat and come down to the front. First of all, shake the preacher's hand. Pray the prayer. Confess with your heart. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth and tell somebody. Now you're saved. Oh, everybody's going to clap. Hallelujah. The, the angels rejoice over one sinner who comes home. They're throwing a shindig up in glory about you coming home to Jesus. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Now, <laughs> that's it. You're in the kingdom. You're going to heaven. Now what do you do? Well, we would probably enroll you in a new believers class so you can learn what it is you got. The Catholic church is exactly the opposite. They make you go to class for a year before they'll ever let you pray the prayer. <laughs> <laughs> huh? so, so you know what you're getting into. It's unfair. I, I, you know, it's, I knew there was something wrong rolling with this you pray this prayer. You believe in Jesus. Brother, the, James 2 says the demons believe that Jesus is God and they tremble. But they're not going to heaven. 
So there's more to, that, more to Christianity than just believe. And that was bothering me as a Protestant pastor because here I'm trying to lead people to faith and that's what, I, that's what I was told to tell them. Come on up here and pray this prayer and you get your ticket punched and baby, you going. You are going to heaven. Because you, one time you believed in Jesus, you prayed the prayer. Now I'm being a little bit silly and facetious and please don't have your feelings hurt. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm just telling you, it was a little ridiculous to tell a man that all you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is God and you're going to heaven. That's not all you have to do. And that piercing question, and to tell me that I have assurance of salvation, I know, I know, I used to do this to people. Protestants would come up to you and say, brother, if you died tonight, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And if you say, well, I'm Catholic, wrong answer. They're going to have you in the parking lot for three days. <laughs> so they get you saved and you have assurance of salvation. What you say is yes by the grace of God and because there's a whole lot of theology there. What we as Catholics say is we have a firm hope and sure confidence that if we do what God tells us to do, yes, we're saved, we're going to be going to go to heaven. But you'd have to be God to know who's saved and who's not saved. You get, uh, this was a huge revelation for me to stop judging people by what they look like. I don't know their heart. I love, Catholics won't judge you. We thought it's because they all like to sin anyway so nobody would point the finger at the other one. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, but that's not true. I know you think the only prayer they know is B14, I-29, bingo. No. <laughs> oh, wow. But assurance of salvation and all that, it's all on the website. Get the set of tapes. I'm really plugging that set of tapes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's get our next caller, Benjamin from Washington. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? My question is, is um, I'm becoming Catholic. Welcome home. Um, yeah, it's be actually because of your program, believe it oh. or not. Woo! Oh, um, and I'm having problems with my family. Yeah. Um, they say, you know what, Ben, it's great that you're becoming Catholic, but every single time anything comes up spiritually, they're like, well, Ben, you believe this, but no, 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 that's not right. Um, yeah. I was raised brethren, <laughs> yeah. and my sisters are brethren now, and they're the ones with the difficulties. They're like, yeah. well, Peter's not a pope, you know, wasn't the pope, or all this stuff, and and basically um, how, how the crucifix is how you guys worship the crucifix and all of this other stuff, and as you said, the saints and everything. Yeah. And I just want to know how can I deal with that? And how could I say, hey, listen, this is, you know, <laughs> this, yeah. is not what you, you know, this is not what you believe. And I know Catholics don't believe that. I don't believe that. But, you know, that's what they... Well, Ben, okay. I'll, first of all, again, our prayers are with you. And uh, both Michael and I have been where you are. I mean, we've been on that journey. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> I tell you, brother, God bless you, and I'm praying for you that God will give you fortitude and strength and courage and an abundance of charity. Um, you know, I, I've never, I just moved back home a couple of years ago because we're not pastoring anymore. I'm traveling full time in evangelization so we could live anywhere we wanted to as long as there's an airport close by. So I moved back home, and uh, my precious little mama's watching tonight, my little Baptist mother, 78 years old. She said, don't you tell people you moved home because I'm getting old. I said, okay, I'll tell them I moved home because I'm getting old, and I need to be close to you. But, uh, you know, I'm back around my family. For the, I've never lived with them as an adult. I graduated in high school in 77, went off to college, went off to pastor, got married, started a family, and we've lived away for 25 years, so I didn't. You know, all the Catholics that talk about the struggle with their family, I didn't have that because, well, by phone. And the first time my mother actually when I came into the church was four years ago when she watched The Journey Home. I said, Mom, I'm going to be on TV. I got something to tell you. Watch this show. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that terrible? <laughs> big, muck, 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 big chicken. <laughs> Great man of faith and power. <laughs> Stood chicken and tell his Baptist mama he became Catholic. Anyway, I was trying to let her down slow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she's so precious. You know, you can, I don't know if you can tell, but she's my hero. So, uh, first of all, you love them unconditionally, and then you have to learn the faith. Yeah. You have to know the faith. The reason most apologists that do what I do, and Evangelist, and Marcus, the Coming Home Network, San Juan, San Juan uh, seminars that have those apologetic books, all Kath Patrick Madrid, and all these, yeah. all that material is so that you have answers for their questions. But you know what? The greatest thing is going to be is your witness in front of them of how much you love Jesus. And you haven't changed loving Jesus, and you still read your Bible, and you still pray. You know, my folks, my family I know watches everything I do. And they go, oh, is that Catholic? Did you learn that? Mom said, I know why you became Catholic, so you could drink, smoke, and cuss. <laughs> I said, heck yeah. <laughs> I didn't say heck either. <laughs> 
But, uh, <laughs> you know, that we, have a, we have different ideas of what it means to love Jesus and follow him. But both groups, I think, are after the same thing. And that's what we've got to work for. We've got to work for the unity. And the way to tear down the walls is somebody because, I like, Scott Hahn said this somewhere, some conference we were at together. He said, the way God seems to be doing this in the last 10 years or so is he takes one family member and makes them Catholic. He plants one member. Now, why he picked me? Well, probably because I got the biggest mouth of all six kids, but <laughs> takes one family member out of a bunch of Protestant Christians and makes one of them Catholic. And it's either to torment them to death or to open their eyes to a whole new world. Amen. All right. Michael, thank you for joining us on the journey home. You're welcome. Website again is MikeCumby.com. MikeCumby.org. Dot org. O -R -G. MikeCumby.org. Lots of goodies on there. And find out about your speaking and your, your tapes and schedule stuff. Schedule is on the speaking schedule. All of which schedule, is designed man. to help people grow in their faith. Thank you very much Amen. for joining Thank us you. again. Thank you for enthusiasm, our love for Jesus and the church. I appreciate you Amen. demonstrating that to our audience. Thank you all for joining us. Hope this has been an enjoyable evening as well as an encouraging one as we seek by grace to follow our Lord Jesus Christ. See you next week.